for what reasons did you choose to come to China and work with Chinese teams to make documentaries? Um, I didn't actually uh, choose to come to China to work with Chinese teams. I came to China to um, originally to make a film called Better Angels, which we started at the end of 2013. And that was a film, it was a big film, which was about the relationship between the United States and China, the future of the relationship between the US and China. And uh, it, it was clear from the beginning of that project that if I was going to be successful at all in trying to make a film which was 50% about uh, China, um, I was going to need to work with Chinese filmmakers. Um, principally, I knew I needed a very um, strong Chinese producer. So my original um, search was for uh, a producer who knew documentaries, who'd worked both in the West and in, um, in China, and who had a good track record and knew China well, because obviously this was going to be a very challenging project. Um, we found um, a producer called Han Yi, who had worked um, on some very interesting and striking films, that, Chinese films that had been internationally successful. And uh, she was our kind of um, uh, the, the, the person who opened the door to, um, to shooting in China. I always had a, um, a basic Western crew, but the Western crew was augmented um, frequently by very good Chinese cinematographers and, um, and uh, other production personnel, sound people, interpreters, researchers, all kinds of people. Um, so that project lasted quite a long time. It was a very um, difficult film to make for a variety of reasons. And um, we were making it in China and in America and in many other countries also because the idea was to, to introduce a Western audience to what China had become in the last 40 years. And um, what China had become was an international global power, um, a, power a, a country with all kinds of influence in many fields and... Um, we wanted to show that. So, you know, we, we shot in Europe, we shot in Africa. Everywhere where China was uh, in the world, we shot. And, um, but of course, we were making that film during the Trump administration's um, increasingly hostile um, approach to international relations with China. And so it was a very difficult and, and bumpy ride because the, the zeitgeist, the mood, certainly in the United States towards China was, um, was, 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 was never very good during that period, but it actually got worse and worse. And by the time we distributed the film, um, we, were, you know, we were trying to sell China as a positive um, uh, influence in the world and a to have a positive relationship with America. And the American public wasn't buying that because Trump had been singularly successful in his kind of hostile jihad against China. So um, it was a wonderful film to make. It was actually a very good film, but it met with a lot of resistance and a lot of hostility from people who thought that we were just propagandizing on behalf of China which was regrettable and it wasn't true, but it was, it was, um, it was a time, and I don't think the times have, in, have kind of improved since. It was a time when China was definitely um, playing defense to America's uh, singular uh, fear of the rise and the renaissance of China. Um, I chose to stay in China after making Better Angels because Better Angels was um, was received with a lot of skepticism and hostility. And um, what I thought was being sold to the Western public 
was um, singularly um, untrue, dishonest, and in my opinion, um, very dangerous. Because the right-wing forces, and actually some of the kind of liberal democratic forces, po political forces in both my country, in the UK, and in America, were, um, were, were kind of fomenting a, 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 a um, fear of China, which I just felt was entirely misplaced. America and Western Europe, the colonial powers, are used to being in charge. They're used to having it their own way. They're used to being top dog. They're used to telling the rest of the world how to behave. They have a kind of... Um, uh, uh, a, 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 they, they feel they have a sense of self-righteousness about their way being the only way. Um, and Western liberal democracy is a perfectly good system, but it doesn't have to be the only system. But from their perspective, the ascent of an Asian power, particularly, because I think there's a certain amount of racism involved in this, the, the rise, the renaissance of an Asian power was a, was a kind of primal challenge to their preeminence. And they became bullies. And I saw the bullying. I saw it in the newspapers. I have friends who work at the New York Times. It's a great liberal democratic newspaper, except where China is concerned. And then they become kind of propagandists for a kind of right-wing Republican narrative, which sees China as an existential threat to everything that America represents. I didn't like that. And I thought it was worth spending a few years in China to see whether or not, at least in my work, I could kind of show more nuance, show more balance. Um, I'm not a propagandist for China, but I see value in China and in the Chinese people. And I see that there are more commonalities. There's more that the Chinese have in common with people in the West than the differences which were being exploited for political reasons. So I decided to stick around for a while and see if I could kind of put a human face on China, the Chinese experience, and on, you know, Chinese modern civilization. Wuhan was a very special circumstance. Um, from my perspective, I saw almost immediately that this outbreak of COVID-19 in Wuhan was the perfect opportunity for the West to attack China. And within weeks of the pandemic starting in, in Wuhan, Donald Trump was calling it the China virus. Um, he, was, he was victimizing China. China was already on the back foot. It was playing defense. It did not know what to do about the virus at the beginning. It was, it was struggling um, to control it and to contain it. And, it was, and, and, the, and the country was being undermined by a disingenuous, vicious uh, foreign campaign to, um, to, make China, uh, to, for, make, to, to make sure that China took the blame. And I didn't think it was appropriate. We went to Wuhan and we saw how after a few weeks of confusion and, and um, experimentation and, and, and not quite knowing what on earth this thing was, the Chinese central government took control within about three weeks, three and a half weeks, and um, made the very brave um, political decision to isolate Wuhan, to lock it down, to build walls around it, if you will, so that the virus could not jump those walls, could not get out of Wuhan, and potentially infect the entire Chinese nation. It was a hugely controversial and risky decision, which someone in Beijing made. It probably went all the way to the, to the uh, president, although we don't know. 
But we saw how China reacted, and China reacted heroically, frankly. Um, they sent 42,000 doctors and nurses. They sent 40,000 construction workers. They built huge hospitals in a matter of days. And although it was difficult, undoubtedly difficult for the people of Wuhan, who had to stay home and were frightened because they didn't know how, how uh, contagious the, the uh, virus was, but they knew it was dangerous. But they, they trusted their government and they did as they were asked. And within a matter of a couple of months, that virus in Wuhan was contained, controlled, and those, those, um, those uh, restrictions were list, uh, lifted. And it happened um, in record time compared to everywhere else in the world. And I wanted to see how that, uh, that kind of imposition of state capacity, which I don't think any other country on the planet is capable of, could uh, mitigate the risks and help China to fight this horrible, horrible virus. We made a film, I think it was a pretty good film, and it's still waiting to be uh, seen. I'm, I'm hopeful that in time we can, um, we can show the world how well China handled this crisis. How do you evaluate the film and television environment in China? And is it more friendly to Western directors? Uh, when you ask about the film and television environment and its, and its kind of openness and friendliness to Western directors, I actually think that it's not even, in China, the environment's not even friendly to Chinese directors right now. And I regret that. I think it's a great shame. I think one of the effects of China being under siege from the West and from other countries, from being criticized for its success in, in, in um, transforming over the last 30 or 40 years is that um, the central government in China is supremely cautious about media and about messaging. And there are some hugely talented Chinese filmmakers, directors, actors, cinematographers. And right now they're not really getting an opportunity to have their voices heard in China, notwithstanding um, in the rest of the world. And I hope China can be a little bit more uh, self-confident and um, throw a little of that caution into the background, trust their filmmakers, trust their artists, because I think there's a, there are millions of stories that can be told here in this country. Some of those stories will play very, very well in the rest of the world. One way to talk about this is to look at South Korea. South Korea is a small country with a very vibrant culture and everyone everywhere in the world admires South Korean culture, South Korean movies, South Korean music. China could be at least that and much, much more. And yet, right now, China is kind of holding back its artists. And, um, you know, one of the ways we in the West measure a society is how vibrant the artistic community is and how, how um, their messages get out to the world. It would be lovely to see that happening in China. What is the most difficult and challenging part of filming in China? How did you overcome the difficulties and persevere? Well, one of the things I can say with certainty is that I have not overcome all the challenges of shooting in China. It's very difficult for a Western director who does not speak Mandarin to shoot in China. So one of my big personal challenges is how to um, talk to and, and have conversations with my subjects. The most important thing about the kinds of films that I make is trust. The people who we film need to trust us because we need to ask searching, sometimes difficult questions. 
Nobody's going to answer you if they don't trust you. And so the first step in making a film in China, it's actually the first step of making a film anywhere, is trust, of building trust, establishing trust and maintaining trust. So that every time we show up with a camera, people want to talk to us rather than want to be reticent or just close themselves down. That's the first thing. The second challenge of making films in China, of course, is censorship. And one of the things we have to respect when we work in China is that China has censorship. They look at our films and they say, we like that, we don't like that, can you change that a little bit? But the one thing that you have to bear in mind, which people in the West absolutely forget, is that censorship everywhere. And I used to work in Los Angeles. I used to work for Hollywood studios. I used to work for the television networks. I've never made a film in the West that hasn't also encountered censorship. Censorship is really just oversight, the system's oversight. You work for NBC, CBS, the BBC. You work for Warner Brothers, Paramount and Sony. There are whole departments of people looking at what you're doing and making sure that you're doing it the way they want it to be made. Every filmmaker encounters that, unless you're an independent filmmaker with your own money, and then you just go and do what you want. But otherwise, Hollywood studios, American British television networks, everyone has oversight. That's not the issue. The issue is how you maneuver to get your message out to the widest possible audience. And that is what one measure of what makes a good film director. In your personal experience, what is the biggest difference between working with a Western team and a Chinese team? Is there anything you can learn from the relatively mature film industry chain in the Western countries for China's film development? Generally speaking, if I'm working in the West, I'm working with a very seasoned crew of people who've been doing what they do um, for many years, and they are part of a Western tradition, a filmmaking tradition, a documentary film tradition, and a narrative film, storytelling tradition. That's not the case in China. China is, and I mean, this is a 5,000 year old civilization, but China is a new country. And the Chinese film business is a very new entity. It didn't really emerge until the 80s. And before that, they, they, were, they were largely making just, you know, kind of government approved propaganda films. Suddenly a narrative tradition has started to emerge in China. And there's some very good films have been made during the 90s. It was a golden period of Chinese narrative films. And um, we saw how good Chinese filmmakers could be. That has, that has become less so in recent years, and I hope to see it grow again. Because as I said already, there are some enormous, uh, enormously talented people here. But you need time. You need time to learn. You need time to practice your craft. You need time to make mistakes, and you need time to learn from those mistakes. All of that's happened over the last 70, 80 years, at least, in the West. It's only just started to be even possible in China. So I'm, you know, I'm optimistic in the long run, but it's still quite difficult, the, you know, the, the, especially in the documentary tradition, because... I think until quite recently, documentaries weren't really taken very seriously in China. You know, people would write the film on a piece of paper and then the documentary filmmaker would go out and collect the pictures and they'd stick them into the narrative. That's not making a documentary film. And so quite often people who work with Artifact, with our company, uh, are quite surprised at the way we produce our films and how long it takes just to choose the characters for our films. There's an enormous amount of research that goes into, into figuring out who our characters are and what their stories are. And are those stories deserving of 
30 minutes of screen time or 60 minutes of screen time or even 90 minutes of screen time. Those assessments take time because if you get it wrong, you suddenly find that you have a weak character in your movie, then your movie is not going to succeed. Oftentimes I see, when I look at documentary films, I see that the directors have not really formed an emotional bond with their characters and so the stories tend to be quite one-dimensional. So Chinese filmmakers still have a long way to go and a lot to learn. I'm optimistic. I think it's going to happen, but you know, we need time. I think the more Western films that Chinese filmmakers can watch, I mean, I think Chinese filmmakers are just as smart, just as intelligent. Their acuity is just as great as filmmakers in the West, but they haven't had the opportunity and they haven't had the tradition, as I said already. But if you watch a lot of documentary films, you can choose, you can see how, you can deconstruct how other directors have told their stories. Start by copying those techniques and applying it to Chinese situations and Chinese characters. And slowly, slowly, these films will become more mature, they'll become more strong, more communicative, and more emotional. Because the one thing, it's very difficult in China, even for me, and I'm, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, but it's, it's, it's tough to make an emotional bond with a character in China. There's a, there's a, a natural, almost like a hardwired reticence. People don't um, push themselves forward. They don't want to sell themselves to a camera. You ask them a question, they're quite shy. They're not really shy, but they are not used to being asked direct questions about their emotional or personal life. Once you've got over that barrier, the floodgates open and Chinese people are just as willing and able and thrilled to talk about themselves and their lives. Um, it takes a little while. So the most important component of Chinese documentaries, which is still absent, is emotion. Is getting people to be emotionally honest on camera. That's a big mountain to climb. And I think it's actually a big mountain to climb for Chinese directors because they're not themselves used to being open and emotionally honest. If they can't do it themselves, they can't expect people to give back. So it has to be a two-way street. How do you adjust the regional differences in audience tastes due to different cultural backgrounds of different countries? Would you make films that fit the taste of local audiences? You know, I, I, I've been asked to make films for a Chinese audience. We just did a series called the Long, A Long Cherished Dream. It was very much for a Chinese audience, but every time I do something, I want to have the possibility that the films can also travel. Because um, for me to tell Chinese stories to Chinese people, I, you know, it's not really my job. I'm not Chinese. I shouldn't be doing that. Chinese directors should be doing that. So when I make a film, I make it with Western techniques and Western kind of modalities so that although I hope Chinese people will appreciate it, I really want to send it abroad where China needs help and where I think these films can act as a weapon to break down barriers and resistance and prejudice against China. So um, there's, there is no easy answer to this question, but I, I do feel that um, we have to, to some extent, there's an English expression, you have to cut your cloth to suit your pocket. In other words, you can't have big ambitions if you haven't got the abilities to, to kind of realize those ambitions. And I think um, right now we have, we, we made a film for the Long Cherished Dream series, uh, series, which is a documentary series, called Drive Like a Girl. It's a marvelous film about a young woman, very young woman, who is dri uh, driving a long-haul truck across China. And it's a, it's a very affirmative, very heartwarming story about one young woman's struggles 
um, to both get out of abject poverty and also to realize her own kind of um, ambitions in China. That film struck a nerve accord with the Chinese audience, which I was thrilled about. We got a lot of positive feedback. So now what we're doing is we're turning it into a feature film so that we can actually tell this story in more depth, in more, with more emotional kind of nuance to a Chinese audience. That is going to be a challenge for me because, I, as I said many times, I don't speak Mandarin. But I, I feel that this is something where I can both contribute something interesting to Chinese feature films and I can also learn a lot by um, figuring out what works and what doesn't work for a Chinese movie theater going public. So, you know, I'm still learning. I'm not, I don't think I've stopped learning, very much the opposite. What do you think is the definitions of resilience? For a Western director in China, is it important to have resilience in the process of filmmaking? Anybody who wants to be a film director has to be resilient has to be enormously resourceful and enormously um, resistant to criticism because you are going to get criticism. You're going to get all kinds of people saying not very kind things about what you do. And sometimes after you've done your film and finished your film, especially in the area of censorship, whether it's China or whether it's New York City, you're going to have to face the fact that people with power, with the ability to say yes or no, might say no to some aspects of your film. And you have to be resilient to that. You have to be creative. You have to bounce back. And you have to be, in a sense, smart enough and resourceful enough to figure out different ways to say what you want to say. There's no substitute for resilience. And you, you're going to get knocked down constantly. Maybe because you cannot even raise the money to make a movie. And you think, oh, are my, are my ideas worth it? Nobody wants to give me money. Is this a... If you believe in your ideas, be resilient and fight for your ideas. Sooner or later, maybe, you'll get your film made. There's a very famous film. When I first went to Hollywood, there was a director, is a director called Oliver Stone. He'd been wanting to make a film called Platoon for 12 years. Every single year for 12 years, he'd been turned down. Every single year, they would said, nobody wants to watch a Vietnam War film. He kept going. And after 12 years, he made the movie and he won more Academy Awards than any other film for decades. He was resilient. And um, it was a great film. I admired what he did. And it was an inspiration to a lot of fil independent filmmakers who said, if Oliver can do it, we can do it. So there is no substitute for resilience, for keeping going, regardless of the forces kind of arrayed against you.